Okay, well, thanks very much. We'll start our, uh, our virtual meeting. This is the first meeting since we had a face to face meeting in February, I think. So uh, but I should say we'll start off, if you don't mind, with all the microphones uh, mute, muted. And then if you can do the raise your hand thing when I know you want to speak, then I or Alex will unmute your mic so we can speak. If we don't have them all muted, we get problems with feedback and technical problems. Okay, first item is attendances. I think we're all present. Have we had any uh, apologies, anybody? Joe? Uh, no apologies reported to me, Chair. No, thanks. Um, questions from members of the public, item two? Anything, Joe? No, none received, Chair. Right. Item three, declarations of interest. Unless people want to make them now, they can make them as we go along. Item four is the minutes of the last meeting, which was the 5th of February because our March meeting was cancelled because of the, the virus. Can we approve those as a correct record? Oh, <laughs> can you raise your hands? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. But now we did, item five should be the next item, but we did say we'd invite, uh, at least I said, we'd invite uh, Councillor Ross to come along uh, as uh, exec member for finance and so on. And uh, Tom, could you... We ask you to present item nine, which is the uh, the revenue budget monitoring and outturn report. Could you do that, Tom? And uh, I'll, you can unmute yourself, I think. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for inviting me to your committee meeting. Um, so I'll present the outturn of our revenue and capital budgets for last year. Our position for the year is a budget underspend of 298,000, which was transferred to the budget support reserve. Changes in the reserves are set out in um, paragraph 11, but I'd draw your attention to the COVID-19 grant support reserve established during 2019-20 um, to hold COVID money that we've received from the government. 1.397 million supported the 2019-20 budget and the year end balance was 4.72 million, which is in reserve for use this year. Um, looking at the capital outturn, it's set out from paragraph 23 onwards. Um, our actual capital expenditure for the year is 38.48 million versus the budget, budget at 65.63 million. Um, that will be reprofiled, but obviously we've got COVID considerations now in terms of, um, in terms of future capital planning. Um, and with that, that is last year, and I'm happy to take questions on last year or indeed any more um, relevant questions in regards to, to this current year, if you'd like me to, Chair. Thanks, Tom. Uh, okay. I see Judith Lloyd wants to ask a question. Judith, can you unmute yourself and speak? Two minutes, see what that. Are you unmuted, Judith? I'd, I say, yes, I am unmuted. Yeah. I'd actually got my hand up, but um, I I'd, 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 by accident. All right. <laughs> but, but having said that, um, could I just ask a, a question about, um, there's quite an underspend on staffing, and I know that some of that's been explained in the papers uh, about particular staff. I'm thinking about uh, governance and community, and I understand that, but it does seem a lot to me. Tom. Okay, I mean, that isn't uncommon for an, an outturn report. Um, obviously, an ideal position is for the council to be well resourced with, with, with staffing so that we can continue our functions as, as, as usual. But um, I'm not aware, unless Graham says anything, I'm not aware of any particular challenges around um, staffing in those areas. It may just be the, 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 the turnover within in the, those areas but it's not our intention to kind of, to to not uh, not have uh, the resource that's needed for for, for, for different parts of the council if graham's got any comments on that particular section i'm sure he's happy to come in now yeah i think um I'm, I'm not aware of any specifics i think as as councillor ross says there is always a turnover what what we can do um is get a breakdown of that 533 to show you just to see what service areas that was so happy to do say that I won't do that. Okay. Is that all right, Judith? Nod. Yeah. Thanks. Councillor Duffield is next. Had a hand up. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of um, observations and then questions for Councillor Ross. Um, I, I suppose that, that last last year it was a, was a good outturn that we were 298,000 that we could put across into reserves, but obviously the world has changed since the since the end of March. Um, that we had a budget that the whole council very sort of unusually the whole council agreed in um, in February of this of this year. So there was cross party support for that for that budget and then obviously the speed of response and the world and the things that the council's done in, in a in a brilliant way since that have obviously brought some level of, of, of extra budget pressure that we weren't um, we weren't expect, expecting that we've had two years of managing the budget very well and the sort of the, the thanks to the, the team there and to, the, and to the executive for making sure that um, that the budget for the, the two years that we've been in control of the council has been um, has been very well managed. So I suppose the questions going forward are, um, and some of this will come under the risk item as well um, when, when we move on to that a little bit later. But obviously the vulnerabilities of the council in general going forward. I think um, a little bit of sort of further information around that. There's obviously lots of pressure in key parts of our service about looking after our vulnerable adults and our vulnerable children going forward. And we can see where some of the pressures were last year. And it'd be interesting to see where you think those pressures will come this year. But also in the budget gap that we know is currently existing that we have got and will get some more money from government. But actually that, that the position of where we are at the current time, where we're expecting to be over the over the rest of this financial year and how we're looking in our strategy to find the best and the fairest way forward. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Councillor Duffy, for those, um, those questions. You, you're absolutely right. When we agreed the budget in February, um, our finance position was put on the, the, the risk register as, as a risk. And that was largely reflective of the historically, Trafford has always had, um, compared with other local authorities, low levels of reserve. That's, that, that, that's a historic concern. And with finances continue to be tight and challenging as they have been over the last 10 years, it was an issue that, um, that, that we, we needed to look to address. Things have, uh, have moved on a lot since then. And obviously the, the pandemic has caused a, um, a severe pressure on, on this year's um, expenditure uh, or this year's revenue budget. At present, the up until um, a government announcement, which I think was, um, was, was two weeks ago now, the, the gap for the year was going to be around 23, 24 million as we forecast. So we would be expected to make in-year savings to, um, to, 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 to cover that, um, that budget shortfall. Since then, and since I appeared at the scrutiny committee, there, had, there was a uh, further announcement from the government. That announcement indicated an additional 500 million for local authorities. And we think that that comes out roughly 1.7, 1.8 million for Trafford Council. So that reduces the 25 million, 20, well, 24 million by a little bit. On top of that, the, you'll see that they also have come to get put together a, a scheme for recouping some of the income that councils have, have lost over the course of COVID. Um, in terms of the income, that is, um, that is income re like car park re re revenue, um, traded services, so the services that we sell on to, to different people. That's the sort of income that they're looking at. And it is not our investment income or any dividend from Manchester Airport, which is obviously one of the one of the key things that we've we've, we've lost um, as part of this as part of this uh, pandemic situation. Um, that will again help. We think by a few million, and I know Graham will probably um, help with that. But we're, we're thinking it might be just over four million that we'd be looking at in terms of that could be what we we, we recoup that way. And then finally, we've got the opportunity to capitalise the, um, the, the gap that we've had in terms of the, the, the lost income from council tax and business rates, where businesses have been, um, have been ex still paying business rates. Um, and again, that will help close the gap a little bit, 
but we're still looking at a, a gap. And I'd love to be able to give you an exact figure as to what that is at the moment. Officers are working very hard to, to come up with an exact, as exact figure, but the range is very broad. So I know that if I was to provide you with, 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 with some form of figure now, it's likely to be very wrong because we've still got to um, you know, look, at, look at the exact um, budget pressure. In terms of what you say about the, I will say in, ter in terms of that gap, officers are working hard at the moment on proposals following a workshop with the executive. There'll be further workshops into August and then when we're in a position to present something to the council, we, we, we certainly will be. Um, we are looking to protect services as best we can, but the challenge is yeah, very difficult. Um, so there will be some difficult decisions that the executive and then council will have to um, will have to consider as part of that process. Um, demand pressures at the moment. We are we're going to be presenting a outturn report. Well, sorry, so a period two report to executive at the next executive meeting. We never do that. Um, but that it does indicate that we're underspending in our demand-led services at this point in time. But again, I would take that information with a pinch of salt. Um, we're very, very early on in the, uh, the the budget year, and and to be quite frank, when you see the news about the impact that COVID has on the longer term on the population, it wouldn't surprise me if there are issues that um, that, that 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 emerge during the rest of this year that would have an impact on particularly our maybe our adults budget in particular. Um, and then the bigger thing to consider as well, so aside from this, this budget year, we are looking at a considerable budget gap for 2021 to 22. Um, we came into this budget year looking at a forecast of around 15 million. Obviously that is, um, is looking at about 32 million as a budget gap for next budget year, in addition to the, um, to the gap that's emerged during this year. So Hopefully that's covered everything that you you asked for, but obviously I can I can try and answer anything else, and I'm sure Graham is is there on hand as well. Okay, if that's okay. Next is uh, Councillor Wynne Stanley, then Councillor Coggins. After that, Barry, can you uh, unmute? Or am I? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. I had two questions. The first one was exactly the same one that Councillor Duffield asked. So <laughs> thank you for that detailed response, Councillor Ross. But the, the second one was, um, I'm watching the reaction of central government only from the, the broad terms and terms of the announcements that are going out through the press. So it's a question of how, as, as, the, as the council and other councils see those gaps developing, and they are developing, how proactive and sympathetic is central government to the, the plight of a local authority, specifically Trafford? Um, thank you. In, in, in terms of that, that, that question, it, it, it does concern me um, the, the way that uh, the government has a, has approached this. Obviously, if I'm to be fair to them, they are in a situation where they're having to manage a pandemic, and there's been a number of unprecedented, a word that's been used a lot, actions that have been taken over the past few months to, to tackle that. Having said that, um, as Councillor Duffield alluded to, the, the role of the local authorities across, uh, across the country, it's really stepped up in response to um, in response to the pandemic and we've been doing a lot of things on a local level and there is an expectation that we'll continue to do a lot of things on a local level to help manage local outbreaks of COVID and obviously the long-term consequences. My concern is that the response and the support that we've been getting from government has been piecemeal. Um, it's been very, very gradual, very, very slow. It's, it's felt as if, and this isn't a party political response because I know that cons you know, different councils of different political colours have all been pressuring the, um, the government, but it, it, it's felt as if we've been getting stuff drip by drip and that is not easy when you're looking at trying to manage the long -term, longer term, medium to long term finances of a, uh, of a local council. The ideal situation would be that we'd get a fundamentally much stronger package from the government. However, that is still a work in pro progress. And um, I know there is a lot of cross party work with the LGA doing a lot to try and, um, and, and convince the government 
of the value of properly resourcing us so that we can carry out the work that they're expecting us to do. Okay, Barry. Yes, that's great. Thanks, Tom. No, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Geraldine. It's your your next. Thank you. Yeah. Um, two things I just wanted to clarify. Um, Councillor Duffield's comments. Not uh, although there was cross party support for the budget, there wasn't all party support. The Green Group did vote against the budget because um, we felt there wasn't. Um, sufficient action on the climate uh, emergency, including low and no cost action, um, which had been recommended since since last September. Um, just on um, the report, uh, paragraph 33, obviously I realise this is an outturn, um, but um, there's delays mentioned in the Sail Water Park and Altrincham Town Centre cycle link schemes. Now, I know that over the last um, month or two, um, we have received funding from the government to support cycle schemes, but the A56 um, and also I think some other parts to um, speed up some of the other schemes we have going. So just wondering, I suppose, if there's any update on what's going on with those two schemes in particular finance wise. And really, I suppose, um, just to plead that when we're thinking about the bigger picture, financial future and security of the borough, that, you know, getting people able to move around freely uh, to support our local businesses is, is really important. And that we've got to look at the evidence that shows us that actually active transport really, really helps our local economy and helps the circular economy, keeps money in Trafford, keeps people spending in our town centres. Yeah, thank you. I, I know that Gray will want to come in with this, but this is a matter of reprofiling some of the capital spend into, into this, this year. And I know that Councillor Duffield, who is one of our local cycling champions, and I think went on the cycle ride uh, over the weekend, I know she'd completely agree with you as I do in terms of the, you know, it, it's crucial that we get active travel right. And yes, that would be a priority capital project that, uh, that you know, we and, well, me and executive <laughs> colleagues would like to see progressed. It is an important way to keep people active, which is what we want to do. We want to have people healthy as a way of combating the, um, you know, the, the pandemic. It also is a way of supporting our town centres and supporting the local economy. So I would say it is very important to me. Um, I know it's very important to a number of colleagues that uh, I can see on this, on, on this uh, meeting, and it's the same with the executive. But I'm sure, Graeme, if he wants to add anything about the reprofiling, he, he'll come in now. Yeah, just to add, I'm not aware there are issues to do with the financing. I just think it's probably more, as it says, more on the design um, and getting the legal agreement sorted out. But again, more than happy to provide a further briefing, Councillor Coggins, just on, on that on that issue. Yes, please. It, it does say on the Ultracom Town Centre one that it needs an increase in funding. So, so one was a design, the sale one was a design issues, but the other one it did mention funding. So if, if we could have an update, that would be brilliant. Sorry, Thank yeah, you. you're right. Sorry, I was referring to the water part when I said that, weren't I? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I shall have a look. Thanks. Okay, that's okay, Geraldine. Thanks. Councillor Boys is next. Can you unmute yourself, Chris? Yeah, right. OK, um, it's um, it, it's partly like, it's on the same topic ish, but I'm just sort of going back to like the pre COVID year, as it were, and, and sort of moving, moving that forward. And, and, and the points, one point's already been made, obviously, about demand led services. Councillor Ross has always said, well, we're starting off OK, but we all know that what happens, generally speaking, in October, November, December, it sort of it goes the other way. And clearly in 1920, the adult services had a, had an outturn variance of, of nearly three million pound adverse, um, which effectively, uh, among one or two other things, was sort of covered within the budget by council wide budgets, which was um, contingency release more particularly and also the dividend for the airport um and and i just wonder really what is council Ross's view of like assuming that let's say we do actually end up with some adverse situations on demand led um does he really do we think that council-wide budgets are actually going to prop it up again effectively i i doubt that they will uh, which leads me on to and, and i have no idea what the answer to this question is i hasten to add how close does he think we actually are going to get 
to the 114 situation um, in the next 12 months. I mean, that's and that is just a, that's not a political point. It really is a genuine concern when you read in the press that of the of the councils that are getting there, that you've got a quote of only a list of about half a dozen, which includes Trafford, it includes Tameside as well. And that is a situation of thinking, well, hang on, how close really are we to that? Uh, um, and that's like a, you know, in the public domain as well, sort of being thought about. Right, no, th thank you very much for that. When we, in terms of the demand-led budgets, when we set the budget in February, we did put resource in, uh, we kind of game planned for the way that the budgets have been over the past couple of years and allocated a resource we thought was realistic at the time for meeting our requirements for both adults and children. And you'll, you'll remember from the, um, from the budget, we put in a significant amount of reserves to support the children's budget for some long-term work, invest to save work um, for that area. So at the moment, I would say that, um, that, that there was sufficient need, you know, sufficient money reserved in those budgets to meet our demands for this year. What we don't know at this point in time is, is how COVID is going to have an effect on the those medium term um, demands on those budgets. Um, that is something we're keeping on the watching brief. You're quite right that our demand led budgets, we you know, we, we, we did go over budget on those lines last year and it was money was put in from things like the airport dividend and other investment monies that helped balance the budget overall to the amount that I, uh, that I stated at the start of the um, at the start of the agenda item. Um, it is tight. Um, it's very, very tight. It's obviously in the uh, corporate director for finance and systems gift in terms of she makes a decision about whether she has to um, set, go down the section 114 route. As I said at the pandemic scrutiny committee a couple of weeks ago, if we were in isolation and we were looking at a budget gap of the one that we have at the moment this year and no other council was in this position, then it would have started already. The process would have started already and you'd understand why, you know, it, 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 it would look like a, a necessary step to, to get the, ban the budget back in, into, um, into balance. With the fact that all councils or most councils, as far as I'm aware, are in this situation, some to a much worse degree than others, um, what MHCLG is saying is, at the moment is that anyone that's contemplating or any director of finance that's contemplating starting the Section 114 process, they must speak to MHCLG first. Um, what we're doing as an executive, though, is we do not want to we do not want to countenance the Section 114. We don't think that would be a good approach for the borough. We'd sooner that um, we'd sooner that elected representatives here made decisions on behalf of the uh, the budget on behalf of the people here, rather than uh, rather than commissioners that's been appointed. So that is why we're going through this process at the moment of looking at the the, the, the gap and how we address that gap in year. So as far as I'm aware, we've not or the corporate director hasn't made any approaches to MHCLG in isolation about our particular issue, you know, issue in Trafford. But I know that a number of, um, of corporate directors across the country have been liaising with MHCLG and obviously drawing attention to the fact that to a varying degree, local authorities across the country are facing very dire financial, uh, financial um, forecasts in year. That's okay, Chris. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor Ross. Sort of uh, very, uh, yeah, a very well succinct response and a lot, quite a lot of information in what you said. Thank you. Yeah. Graham, you, your hand is raised. Is that? Yeah, I think as Councillor Ross said, it, it, it's in the gift of the Section One Five One officer to to raise the the One One Four notice. I think. I think the issues we've got at the moment are obviously the financial challenge is extremely, extremely difficult. I think, I think we 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 we're comforted to some extent by the fact that CLG are wanting to speak to us. If we feel we are nearing that position, we must we must speak to them. And I think their 
intention is is that they don't want any authorities issuing section 114s as a result of covid now i think just to take look at the budget strategy and the gap we've got um as councillor ross said whilst we balanced the budget for 2021 in february we were indicating we had what what i will term a business as usual gap for 21 22 um and i think whilst we are in a position at the moment of working with government and, and um, CLG, um, what we don't know is what the solution will be around, particularly around the COVID. And I think the, the issue we've got is it's an evolving position. We're very uncertain at the moment of the impact of COVID on things like business rate receipts. Um, government this year are paying basically paying everybody's business rates in the retail sector um what we need to wait and see particularly next year is what what will that mean next year if if they don't do that and what will that mean to receipts? so i think we're just mindful the impact of covid is constantly evolving and changing now in terms of a budget strategy and what we'll be bringing as part of our draft budget proposals i think is the fact that I think we're fairly confident government will not bridge the gap that local governments have got fully and they will expect local government to basically burden share. So I think our strategy is going to be that we must concentrate on that business as usual gap initially and look to bridge that as part of the draft budget proposal. That's something we're working to and obviously watch how the um, COVID impact evolves over the next few months and what government's further reactions will be. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, no, I can't see any more hands up for questions. So thank you, uh, Councillor Ross, for coming. It's very, very useful that I think. And we'll probably invite you back to some future meeting, perhaps after the after the uh, COVID thing is over. So thanks very much for that, Tom. You're welcome to stay if you wish, but you don't have to stay, of course. So well, it's been lovely to be back at a council audit. Um, but I'll I'll get on with some emails now. But thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to come back anytime and enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So next item is uh, item five, the draft annual governance statement, which was circulated, I think, after the main uh, body of, of the minutes. Uh, I think uh, Mark Foss is going to take this rather than uh, Jane Lefebvre. Uh, Mark, that's right, isn't it? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, yeah I'm just uh, on Jane's behalf. Um, it's legal democratic services uh, lead on collating the document. Um, so basically, this is the draft uh, document that's a statutory requirement that we produce one uh, to accompany the council's accounts. So when the external auditors begin their audit of the, the draft accounts, we're also expected to share with them the, the draft annual governance statement, and that gets published on the website. Um, so really bringing it to this meeting um, in line with good practice uh, recommended by SIPFA, it gives uh, committee members the opportunity to review the document and if they've got any thoughts or comments to feed into the final version. Um, because of COVID-19, the, the deadlines have been put back for, for the statutory, for the accounting, the final accounts approval and the AGS. So it's now the end of November as opposed to the end of September. Um, so it gives it does give time to sort of think about if there are any changes to the document. Um, it's it's been collated in a similar way to to previous years. That's been reported to the committee. Um, CLT heads of service managers have all fed into the document. Uh, internal audits also fed into it in terms of our work and things like the strategic risk register, making sure that aligns with what's said in 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 the AGS. Um, and, it, and it follows a recommended format that SIPFA um, have, have put out with seven governance principles and we report against each of those principles. So in terms of the document, half of it is talking about how we feel we've met each of those principles, uh, activity during 1920, I mean, it is specifically a 1920 document, uh, but in saying that it also looks forward uh, in terms of significant issues going forward. So the first part of the document is around what we've done during the year. 
And, and the final half of the document is, is about the significant governance issues. Uh, and that includes what we've done about them during the year and also uh, what we anticipate being the significant issues going forward. So just really to sum up in terms of those significant issues going forward there, they include um, any developments from the Ofsted review and the improvements we're taking as a council on that. Um, what's been talking about at length up to now, the, the council's uh, financial position going forward, um, but also issues that have been previously identified around information governance, um, the contract with Amy, Brexit, of course, um, and very relevant to, to COVID-19 issues, business continuity, making sure we continue to improve our arrangements around that. And, and the wider aspects as well, dealing with the impact of COVID-19. So those issues are, are set out uh, in the document. Um, so really it's a question of uh, if there's anything further to, to add to that. One thing I would add, um, in addition to the document you have, uh, we've been looking at some minor amendments to that as well, just to advise the committee. Um, there's a section under principle F on page 15 um, which is a heading around managing risks and performance. And we're just proposing to add a couple of more sentences in that document. Um, firstly, around the financial position of the council, just to say that the budget's position supported by a robustness statement from the corporate director of finance and systems, uh, which includes an assessment of the adequacy of reserves. So that's a requirement that, that, that we do that. Um, and also some additional wording just to uh, get across that there's bi-monthly budget monitoring reporting. So that that picks up around the revenue budget, the capital program and the reserves. So we're just adding a bit more detail uh, around that in the document. Um, but other than that, that, that the document as it as it stands is there in the papers. Um, okay. so, and just to say as well, if there are any comments even after today, um, if they could be fed through to um, either Jane Lefevre or, or Alexander Murray, who's, who's supporting Jane in, in collating the document, um, please feel free to, to put forward uh, comments to them. Thanks very much. I can't see any hands up. So can we, uh, I think we just have to note that really, aren't we? It's, it's going to, it's only a draft, isn't it? It goes to the yeah. committee and then back. Alan, are you indicating you want to speak or are you just saying thumbs up? All right, okay, <laughs> yes. Okay, so we, we note that and send it to the exec and eventually full council. Th thanks, Mark, for that. Items, item, oh, item six is uh, the, the uh, external audit progress report. That's you, Tommy, I think, isn't it? It is, Chair. Yeah. Yeah, I'll uh, briefly take members through that. I'll assume everyone's had a chance to read the report, so I'll, I'll just try and pick out the main points. Uh, on page seven, uh, we just set out there the arrangements that we've put in place in Mazars uh, for our staff to work remotely. Um, and whilst that's presented challenges, as it we know it's done for the council as well, um, we've been able to successfully continue to deliver our services to clients and complete our required work. Um, and then on page eight, we confirm that prior to the lockdown, we ran a final accounts workshop for councils, uh, which was attended by representatives from your finance team. And we also completed our remain and interim audit work, uh, including some early testing. And there weren't any issues coming out of that uh, that we need to bring to your attention. Then since lockdown, we've maintained an ongoing dialogue with officers. Um, and as a result of the pandemic, um, as Mark mentioned the deadlines for councils to produce draft accounts has moved um, to the end of August and the deadline for the final order to the accounts has moved to the end of November. Um, but the council plan to give us draft accounts this week, tomorrow, hopefully, and we'll then start our audit work from Monday and we'll report back to the committee in our uh, order completion report in October. Uh, on page nine uh, and onwards, we've summarized some recent publications that may be of interest to members. Uh, as usual, there are links to the relevant publications along with some brief summaries of each one. So I don't intend going through those, Chair, 
Um, so that's all I want to say on the progress report, but happy to take any comments or questions. Thanks very much, Tommy. Uh, any questions? Any? I can't. Oh, yes. Chris. Chris Boyce, Councillor Boyce. Yeah, right. Um, can you hear me now? It's fine. Yeah. Right. Um, no, it's, it actually is on, on your page 7, hour 11, like the publications on local authority investment in commercial property that the comments in february 2020 do, do you, are you able to make any observations at all on the portfolio that trafford currently hold in that direction given the increased borrowing during uh, uh, 20 uh, 2019 20 and going forward from that to actually fund it um, we, when we've looked at it in the past, Chair, we've found the Council's had a, appropriate arrangements in place to uh, follow its uh, own rules about borrowing and investment uh, and taking appropriate advice on what to invest in. Uh, so we, we've not had any concerns thus far. Uh, we're obviously still completing our work in the current year, but we've been satisfied with the arrangements in place. Yeah, can, can, I, can I just sort of just a little, little bit of a follow up question on that? I mean, it's, I'm sort of a little bit. Um slightly bemused as to where you would stand on a comment on this where um, let's say the authority has taken what would appear to be good professional advice from reputable professional advisors and yet the comment from certain quarters would be that uh, the portfolio was perhaps a bit more risky than the authority really ought to be embarking upon. I mean, presumably you are basically your accountants, auditors, yes, but would you look to other advisors to comment on it uh, as opposed to the ones that the, the council were using, which as I've said, I mean, I've no question that, that the ones that we are using are, uh, you know, professionally of very good reputation. I think, Councillor, in terms of our responsibility, it would be to look at what arrangements you have in place to make decisions about what to invest in. Uh, so we'd be looking at whether you, you're staying within your powers and you've got appropriate governance arrangements in place and that you're seeking, if you're, if you're seeking expert advice, how you're using that to inform your decisions. I don't think it's for us to sort of second guess those decisions. It's to, it's to, to look at whether you're considering the right information, the risks involved but we wouldn't come to a judgment on your uh, decisions about the level of risk if that is a judgment area. Right, okay, right, thank you very much. Thank you, Tommy, thank you. Okay, thanks. I can't see any other hands raised on this uh, dashboard thing. So thanks very much, Tommy, that's very helpful. Thanks very much. So we're just asked to note that really, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, item seven is the audit fee letter. Uh, Graham, are you going to do this? So, yeah, I can take this chair. This is a quick item. It just basically sets out the the indicative uh, cost of the audit fees for 2021, um, which is at a similar level as um, the current year. That's not to say that we don't um, incur other charges. I suppose that there are local local circumstances that can um, mean that. We, we vary a little bit from that fee scale, for example, if there's it's a requirement to undertake further audit work, but it's a good indication that um, where the audit fees will stand for 2021, which is obviously what, what we base the budget on. So other than that, I think it's just a report for noting. Yeah. Okay, can we just note that? The fee is the same as last year. So it's... Okay, thanks very much. Uh, item... Eight is the Treasury Management Annual Performance Report. Graham, again, I think that's uh, you. Yes, yeah. This is just our standard outturn report on our Treasury management um, activities and performance during the year. So basically, it sets out what we've done around um, the investments of the Council's surplus cash balances and what's happened with our overall debt levels um the debt obviously being taken on to support our capital investment what we've done with this report of late is basically to add on page 21 an executive summary just 
just for the benefit of the committee to bring out some of the major points within the report. Um, just in respect of debt, you'll see that there's been quite a significant uplift in the level of debt from 221 million to 377. Again, that supported our capital investment program, um, which mainly, mainly the big increase relates to the asset investment strategy. Um, most of the loans that we took on, particularly the longer term loans, were from the PWLB and £161 million was taken from them. Just, just by way of interest for the committee, uh, they may or may not be aware of what happened during the year with the PWLB in the um, the lending levels from the P, from the debt management office, the PWLB, were quite significant. Um, so the PWLB is the Public Works Loans Board, so that's the organisation that lends local authority um, its money. So the, the, the core on PWLB during the year was quite extensive from authorities. And the reaction to that was that the PWLB, I think it was in October, increased interest rates by one full percentage point. I think tried to, to try and stem the use of PWLB funds. Um, and obviously there was a link as well with authorities' approaches to, to investments in commercial property and that there was obviously a requirement to try to curtail that. And what, what we've seen as well is is further consultations recently from the PWLB, particularly around what it will and what it won't lend for in the future. Um, and that's something that has been consulted on now and a response will, um, will go back from the council uh, towards the end of the month. So debt has gone up. Um, the interest rates that we pay on the debt on average have fallen. And that I think is because of the, the low rates of interest that we still, even, even with the increase in the interest rate from the PWLB, they are still relatively low compared to what average interest rates were on, on debt that we've taken out historically. Um, there's a term used um, around underborrowed, and just to explain what that is, is that um, Underborrowed basically means where we've not physically taken on external debt to pay for some of our investments. And sometimes it's better value not to do that. And it's really a treasury management function that determines when we actually need to physically replenish our cash balances. And so near end, we've basically not borrowed to the extent of £40 million and we'd use our own cash balance for some capital expenditure. That's probably just some short term types of investments that we've got. Um, in terms of the cash investments that we have, they rose to 106 million at year end from 78 million. I think what we what we did see there was that particularly at the end of the financial year, that obviously with the impact of COVID, that government were providing tranches of funding and cash flow support. So those balances are slightly inflated at year end with, with government at that stage trying to help authorities out in terms of their cash flow. Um, the rates of return that we achieved on investing the monies, obviously we've got quite an active treasury management function. It looks to invest monies on a regular basis. Obviously the, the key issue at all times is security of those funds. Um, we achieved just over 1.1%, which is above national benchmarks and um, gave us about £600,000 of interest. Um, in terms of how we work the cash and do the investments, um, obviously what we're mindful of is we, we need to keep liquid so we know when paydays are coming, so we're investing our monies to coincide with when we need them. But on average, the investment in terms of the life, of, the average life of investments was about just over two months. So some investments are very short term, maybe overnight or a week. Some would be a bit longer, maybe up to 12 months, if not a little bit beyond that. Um, and obviously just the final bullet on the investments on page 21 is all investments were paid on time. 
In terms of prudential indicators, there's a range of governance indicators that are agreed by council at the start of every year around treasury management that set the limits in terms of what we are allowed to borrow within. Um, and basically at the end of the year, what we do is monitor through those through the year and at the end of the year, uh, satisfyingly, we can say that obviously none were, were breached through the year. So happy to take any questions on, on that report, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, Graeme. Any questions? I can't see any hands. Oh, yes, uh, Councillor Winstanley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as an observation and a question, the observation is the is around that the Public Works Loan Board in that all councils had their um, their funding cut and then we're off to the source of very cheap loans from Public Works Loans Board. And who'd have thought it? They all borrowed money to invest because they had they had no choice. And then that funding was then attempted to be cut off. It's almost like there was no real plan behind the the way that was administered because any anybody could see that that's what was going to happen that's just an observation really uh, the question is that um in the section 8.6 on page 32 it's it's talking graham about the um income from the strategic asset investment fund and it's, it says in there that the impact from the um pandemic pandemic will be short-lived and turnover will return to pre-virus levels in 2021. I was just wondering how, what level of confidence that we, we have in that. I think... Sorry, it's not, not an easy question, I know. No, no it, is, it isn't, and, and we don't know. I think what, what we're getting on our investment strategy, and it probably goes back to points raised earlier, is we are receiving regular updates that we take through the investment management board and that we get from CBRE probably every other week. Now, some of the investments that we've got, you'll probably be aware that we've acquired um, in, in a joint venture arrangement with Bruntwood, we've acquired the two miles at Stretford and Altringham. Um, and obviously, and, and prior to that, we acquired the Grafton Centre at Altringham. By definition, these predominantly retail types of assets, we are going to see an impact in the short term. And I think what, what we tried to do in the monitor at the year end that Councillor Ross uh, presented was that we were cognizant to the fact that we could, some of those income streams could suffer um, during what we hope is part of 2020. And, and we did make provision in some of our uh, earmark reserves in case there's a downturn on on the returns we're getting now just just to qualify them returns i think on the assets that we've acquired there they've been acquired for the reasons of regeneration so our budgets don't assume profit to support the rest of our services okay. they are set with the ambition that we will get a return sufficient to cover our borrowing costs and that's something that we just we're keeping a watching brief on. Um, I think the first half of this year particularly is going to be quite testing. Do I think the reserves enough at the moment that we've set aside? Yes, I do. Uh, and hopefully we won't need anywhere near the level of that. And that's just been set aside as a for, for prudent measures. But um, in terms of some of the other properties we've got, we see that they're unaffected. So income from, for example, Sainsbury's in Altrincham, um, there's a distribution, um, a, a distribution type facility we've got at Wigan, not affected. So we have got some um, strong income streams that are still maintaining, but I think it's just really retail aspects within the borough that we've probably got more short term concern over. Uh, thanks. It makes, it makes perfect sense. The bit I've missed, of course, was the mixing properties. I just thought of retail. There's, there's lots, there's lots more yeah. to it, isn't there? That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Thanks for that. Okay, Councillor Boyce, and um, then Councillor Duffy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I, I think yes, you've answered my. I've got two like uh, highlighted bits on the pages of my hard copy of this these papers. 
uh, one of which is in 4.21 about the PWLB, how it's operating. Now you've answered that. And in fact, you've reminded me of effectively what was going on with you behind uh, the reasons why it was being reviewed. Uh, so that's covered. The second is, and uh, I'm slightly, I'm, I thought I was beginning to understand this term underborrowing after seven years, uh, but I've, I've now suddenly become slightly more confused. I'll tell you why I've become slightly more confused. I had looked at, on page uh, 28 under 4.14, the two PWLBs of £17 million each, loans taken to reduce the under borrowing okay um now so that's 34 million to reduce under borrowing and i've just heard that we haven't actually whatever we we've actually increased under borrowing by 40 million by using our own money and I, I just couldn't get my head around this have i have i misinterpreted this we seem to have you know some some sort of equation seemed to be plus plus 40 for minus 34 and it didn't make a great deal of sense so <laughs> just to, it's it's a really good point and it's it's something that we're looking at and, and in terms of understanding if if i'm just trying to explain it what is if we incur capital expenditure so we if we improve an asset and we when we've set our plans we've said we would look to borrow pay for that investment if we don't borrow in year for example because if we think interest rates aren't right or if we think we've got surplus cash balances we can use instead to, to delay that borrowing that's that's when we're using those internal balances rather than going out to the market to take that debt on that's under borrowed so i think historically in the last probably over the last 10 years, I, I bet we've run with an underborrowed position. And, and it's taking the opportunities when they arise to replenish by taking the borrowings on, to replenish our reserves. And, and interest rates have been very low. So if we can replenish our reserves by taking on that debt, that's what we will do. Now, the reason that we still carry an underborrowed position, I think what's fueling that is that some of our asset strategy items involve providing senior debt facilities um, to, for example, developers. Now, these facilities may be only one or two years long, and, and there may be facilities where they say, will you earn £20 million, but phased over a two-year period, and we will draw it down in tranches. So rather than going out to the markets and borrowing for each tranche, sometimes we try and manage that within our own cash flow. And it's more economical and, and it's better in terms of the returns we can achieve to do that. So there's competing things in, in play at both times. It's historical underborrowed, but there's new things coming on stream where you would expect us to borrow. But we, we may say, well, we'll do it internally because it's quite short term. I do accept it's complicated. Does that make any realms of sense? Yeah, I think uh, I think Graham. Yeah, it does. It does. It continues to make a degree of sense. I think. I mean, once once we can get back to sort of non-COVID regular, if you and I have a one-to-one -one chat about, I'm this, more than happy to do that. Yeah, that's probably yeah. probably a good idea. Sort of a face-to-face -face over a cup of coffee at the town hall or something like that. I think, I okay, think just, just, just to finish off, I think rest assured, most authorities are probably in an underborrowed position at the moment. And I think, I think a lot of it stems from the financial crash in 2010, where when people were sat on balances of cash, um, there was a little bit of uncertainty around the counterparties we could invest with. So that was when the underborrowed scenarios seemed to increase and people were saying, well, I'll actually use my own cash balances and invest in somewhere that's a little bit risky. And it, and it stemmed from that, but I'm more than happy just to have a sit down and look in, look in detail. We can explain some of the schemes as well that we, we do it on. Okay. 
Next, Councillor Duffield, next, Councillor. Oh, um, sorry, I've still got my hand up. Yeah, sorry, my um, question was probably not dissimilar to Chris's to some extent around the underborrowing and trying to understand that. So thanks, Graham. I suppose just following on from that then, um, are you expecting the underborrowing sort of strategy sort of by default, I suppose, a little bit to continue into the future? And is it a position that you um, remain comfortable in or would you prefer not to be underborrowed? Would you prefer to be doing different things or the fact that you can get better investments by using our own money? Is, do you think that, that that will continue? And do you think the current position we find ourselves in in terms of um, challenges with our finances will, will change that position at all? Or provide opportunities or other challenges, I suppose? I do, I do think that's a really good question and it's conversations we're having earlier this week. I think, do I see the underborrowed position continuing? Um, not to the extent that we've got at the moment and for the simple reason that, just moving on from the response to Councillor Boyes's question, the reason we're underborrowed at the moment is that we've got some investments that are quite short-term in nature through the asset investment strategy. So they're providing debt facilities that would expire, some expire later on this year. We expect to get a big capital receipt that would in effect pay us back. So that would that would cancel out that underborrowed. I think what underborrowed means is the cash you've set aside historically and put in reserves, you've actually used that to pay for some capital expenditure in the short term. The question will be asked at a point in the future, actually, I need to use those reserves. And as part of your treasury function, you'd be said, well, actually, I, I need to borrow the money now to replenish my reserves back. And I think what we see with COVID and the impact of COVID is that we've got our cash balances, I see, as being run down to a certain extent during 2021. And, I, and what I'm bothered about is that if there is any sort of call on reserves or provisions, will we have the cash in our coffers to meet them? And so I think the ability to keep an underborrowed position going forward, I think, is going to be strained given that we expect that we'll probably be collecting less council tax and business rate income this year, and there's other pressures on income streams. And I think the pressures on our cash balances, I think, will be that strong that well, I don't think we'll have the ability to carry an underborrowed position. Um, so that's just my view, but I think looking at the cash flows, and it's not just a 12-month cash flow, it's, we're trying to look over the next three years because I think cash will go down this year. Just as one example, at the start of this year, we paid our pension contributions to the pension fund we made one payment to cover the next three years. That was forty-two million pounds. Um, now, in years two and three, we won't make any, we won't pay anything because we paid them. But it's been a drain on the cash. So it's it's a bit of a roller coaster in that that cash I think is going to the balances will decline this year, but then hopefully look to recover. So we're just taking that longer term view. And I think that just affects, can we be underborrowed? I think it'll put a strain on that position if we were to do that. Okay. Right, I can't see any more hands up on my screen there. So thanks uh, very much for that, Graham. Okay. Item nine, we actually dealt with earlier with Councillor Ross. So we're going to item 10, which is the 1920 annual head of inter internal, internal audit report, which is, I think, Mark's going to deal with that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this report summarises the work of uh, internal audit through 1920. Um, of course, the committee's had updates through sort of three quarters of 1920. Uh, so the report summarises the findings from that and also adds an update in terms of January to March. Um, there's quite a lot of detail in the report. I'll just try and cover some, sort of the main elements. Um, in terms of internal audit work, work, it's set out in a way in line with our, our, our charter. And there's actually a copy of the charter in the, the next agenda item under the audit plan. Um, but we, we basically follow that as our main sort of protocol. 
Um, a key element of the report is to provide an overall opinion. Um, it's, a it's a requirement in line with public sector audit standards that, that we do this. Um, and you, uh, page 90 sets out the sort of the summary opinion um, and basically talks about the control environment overall operating to a satisfactory standard. Um, of course, individual pieces of work will highlight particular control improvements and as we've reported through the year to the committee um, but overall we see and particularly things like follow-up audit work we do that uh, controls are being implemented that we've recommended uh, and where there are still outstanding actions through the year management of agreed action plans uh, that again will subsequently follow up in the coming year to see you know progress continues to be made um, one thing I would say, obviously, there had been some disruption towards the end of the year uh, with COVID-19, but it hasn't had a significant impact in terms of our 1920 opinion. Um, there was some disruption towards the end of March with certain reports not being finalised, but overall, in the big picture, it didn't have a, a significant impact for, 20, for 1920. I will cover in the next item in terms of the current year. Um, the report sets out the various factors um, to determine that overall opinion of satisfactory um, in terms of, for instance, individual audit opinions we've given during the year, um, the level of management response and engagement with us, uh, and in terms of implementing recommendations. Um, but on, on page 93, for instance, it, it, it shows a summary of the, uh, the opinions we've issued during the year, because see 29 of the 30 were at least medium opinions, um, meaning adequate. But of course, it's still at that point there are there are control improvements and room for improvement. But we thought overall um, adequate processes in place. Um, during 1920, because um, the, the committee had updates from April to December in terms of audits we'd done, uh, in Appendix A of this report, it does provide a list of the reports we issued between January and March, so you have a full record then of, of all the audits we've done during the year. Um, and there are a number of appendices in the report. Appendix B summarises the main categories of work we've done during the year and the time we've spent against that planned uh, and Appendix C lists all the individual audit reports and, and where these have been completed, it shows the, the audit opinion we gave. Um, the report also does cover other work we've done in addition to, to audit reviews, um, providing support in section 3.7 on page 94 so summarizes a number of activities we've been involved in um, supporting the strategic risk register collation um, work around fraud in terms of the National Fraud Initiative that we reported onto the committee uh, in February. Um, various grant claim checks where we've been required to, to certify uh, grant claims uh, and various other guidance th through the year. Um, the report in detail sets out individual categories of work. So section four, it breaks down, we've done elements of work around procurement, IT audit, uh, governance, financial systems, schools. So you'll see some narrative against each of, each of the areas we've been involved in. Um, but a crucial thing for us is in terms of whether we're listened to and you know recommendations we make are implemented uh, and, and reported there in section five that we've had a good response to recommendations. Most have been accepted by management. A very small number that haven't have, have, have tended to be maybe just resource issues and practicalities. Um, but they're, they're few and far between. Um, and also in terms of implementation of recommendations, um, there's a chart in the report that shows 86% have, have been implemented uh, based on you know, recommendations we've made in the previous year. So, so that was pleasing to report. Um, in terms of audit resources, there's been uh, a little less available than originally planned at the start of the year. There has been uh, some staff turnover and a secondment, but we've managed to uh, manage that through the year and we've, we've recruited new staff um, and prioritised work. And also in engaging with services, um, some reviews were rescheduled at the request of services. So we basically managed our resource to make sure we still 
completed all our high priority work during the year. Um, in terms of productivity, we, we had a target of issuing 38 reports, so we fell just short of that, um, issuing 34. There was a little bit of an impact in March in terms of COVID-19, slowing a few audits down, um, but we've been picking those up through the current year. Um, just as a final report uh, thing, really, in terms of the report around our standards, we're required to, to work in accordance with the public sector internal audit standards. So I just make comment there in terms of that we I still consider we're generally conforming with those and we've set out some improvement actions to make sure we continue to do so. Um, SITFA issued some guidance in April about giving audit opinions. So we, at the moment we have five standard opinions going from low to high. Um, SITFA have done a paper after they've surveyed authorities and they've issued some guidance. We're going to review that through the year and bring it back to the committee if we do decide to change our, our categories. Um, in terms of anything since April 20, because um, I can cover in, in, in the next item, so happy, happy to take any questions on, on this report. Thanks, Mark. I can't see any hands up for, for this report, so can we just note that and go on to item 11, which again is Mark again, which is the 2021 internal audit plan. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so the, the audit plan was uh, previously circulated to the committee in March. Of course, we didn't have the meeting itself, but a number of reports circulated at the time, which included that one. Um, but I thought it would be useful for it to be included on the agenda again, just to put a little start, uh, a couple of covering uh, pages to that. Uh, the plan isn't isn't any different to that circulated in March, but on the covering pages, uh, I've just done a note in terms of context for the you know the current year. Um, obviously, with all the the developments since March, to note that the plan as was is subject to ongoing review, uh, and the committee will will receive updates on that at the remainder of its meetings. Um, one significant thing to note is. Because in the audit plan originally, we didn't envisage um, the whole impact of COVID-19 in terms of for internal audit as well. Uh, we've provided quite a bit of support to the council in terms of its response, particularly around business grant payments. Um, so we work with Exchequer Services in helping to undertake checks uh, in the administration of those payments. And then there's been a second batch of discretionary Payment. So again, we've worked with the strategic growth team on that. So there's been quite a bit of audit time been spent along that. So any future updates I do will reflect that. Um, certain pieces of work as well in the plan, we're delaying, rescheduling. I mean, as, as, a, as one example, for instance, sale water side is on the plan. Um, so a number of schools are on the plan. And for practical purposes, we're, we're looking across the whole plan and looking at where it's appropriate to undertake reviews over the coming months and where it'd be more appropriate to, to delay those. Um, so I'll report to the committee in future updates, um, you know, any of those changes uh, as a result of that. So at the next meeting in October, uh, I'll give an update between April and August, all the work we've completed. Uh, and any particular changes I identify to the plan at that stage. Okay, thanks very much. Are there any questions? I can't see any hands raised at this present time. Well, if not, well, we just have to note that, I think, aren't we? And uh, we'll get updates during the year. But next item is, uh, is item 12, uh, the Strategic Risk Register update, which is Mark again. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so... Audits collated um, the information um, in liaison with CLT. Um, corporate directors, heads of service managers um, have been updating their risks over the last few weeks. Um, as you would expect, um, significant impact of COVID-19 is highlighted a risk in itself in the register but also you will see in the narrative against a number of the other risks, um, various aspects of, of, of the impact of that. Um, 
page 166, risk number one, that has the, the, the COVID-19 risk in there, which the Director of Public Health uh, helped to uh, coordinate the update for. Um, obviously, below that, there were a number of risk registers and, and risk details, but that provides a high level uh, detail around that. Um, but you see, in terms of the report mentioned in the introduction part of the report on page 164, um, a number of other risks in the register have changed really as, a, as an, a direct result of the uh, of the pandemic. So the health and safety uh, risk score has increased, the business continuity risk score, and also an extra risk has been added uh, in respect of leisure services, um, again, around the whole, whole issue of the pandemic. Um, so the chart on page 165 sort of summarizes all the risk levels there. Um, and with the added risk of leisure, there's now 15 strategic risks listed there. Um, so throughout the report, each of the 15 risks you'll see have, have, have had updates through June and July on latest developments and on how they're being managed. Um, and we'll continue to monitor those um, and a further update on each of those will we'll come back to the committee again at, at the next meeting. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Duffield, I think. Uh... Yeah, um, just quickly, thanks, thanks Mark. Um, just a couple of points, just on um, risk number six, just around sort of freedom of information and data and, and data issues. Um, we're clearly still finding this quite challenging in, in sort of meeting some of our, our timescales on that. And I think it'd be interesting just to sort of hear a little bit more about our sort of plan for recovery there and sort of seeing how we can we can get back on some of the challenges that that's bringing in. And then also just around risk number 10, just around breaches of health and safety. I think the, is the arrow right there? Because it says we've, that's increased. Uh just have a look at that. Um, but also just while you're doing that, I think obviously the health and safety and protection of our staff is obviously very, very high on our on our agenda and that. And again, the, um, while there's quite a lot of mitigation there, this obviously the risk is still very high and increasing, um, which is which is quite a concern. So just any further comments around that again about recovery and getting back to a, a maybe a more, more stable position would be helpful. Just, just on on the health and safety, um, the yeah. So the risk, uh, the red block there showing the increased score. I think the the reason why the arrows um, are like they are as as looking the same, it's because it's like a an overall management of the risks. It seems there's been a lot of actions taken in addressing the risk. Um, so that column is more about how it's being managed as opposed to the risk level itself. So the, the, the column with the 20 high is it indicates the risk level itself has gone up, but the arrow next to it shows that in terms of the management of the risk, it's being sort of addressed. Um, but perhaps we could have a look at the columns in the report there and see if we could uh, make them a bit clearer perhaps for the next update. Okay, Anne, is that it? Yeah, it's uh, Councillor Winstanley next, and then Councillor Coggins, and then Councillor Boys. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, there's there's a, a general question, and I went through the report trying to find the appendix, I bet it's in there somewhere, which is how do you actually assess the level of risk, or is it just based on 1 to 25 when you make an estimate? That's the, that's the general question. And the, the more specific question, and I think you alluded to it in your answer to, uh, to Anne's um, question. You know, mine was around specifically... Uh, risk for the continuing continuing uncertainty on the medium financial strategy because of uncertainty around central government funding and the risk has not changed since last time and I thought after what uh, Councillor Ross said in his part of the meeting that actually the risk has risen but it might be to do oh sorry I'll let you, I'll let you answer the question without giving, without giving you the answer <laughs> thanks just just taking your first one um, around the, the general scoring assessment yeah. Um, we do periodically share the guidance on that, so I'll, I'll send that round again to members. Um, but there is a, a like a council framework with a scoring framework with a 
with like a, a score of five, a, a likelihood and impact going from one to five. So there's like, so five times five being the highest risk of 25. But in that framework, there are various factors included to say, you know, what might constitute a one, what might cons based on financial factors, reputation, uh, safety, you know, various factors. So, right, so okay. both directors have that guidance when they're, they're putting together this score. So but I'm happy to, to recirculate that to, to the okay, committee. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure in terms of the, f the finance risk, whether um, Graham might want to take that one. Having, uh, yeah, certainly. Just um, we deliberated over this and I think what's made it not go to 25 is the fact that obviously as, it, as the impact of COVID is affecting all authorities, not just Trafford, and, and the work that's going on with CLG and the fact that we don't we don't know the solution at this stage, although government's keen to work with us. And I think from Nicky Bishop's opinion at this stage was that to raise that to a 25 was basically signalling that we would be at section 114 um, territory. So I think I think with a little way to go for that yet. And I think it's just obviously the dialogue with, that we've got with CLG and working towards the solutions prevented that going up stage. Okay, that's brilliant, that makes sense, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Collins is next. Thanks, I have three um, separate, quite separate issues. So I'll do them one at a time if that's best. Um, the first one was about the data breaches on page 172 and 173, which I found really worrying. We've had two of the most serious types of data breach. I think um, uh, an adoptive parents and, um, and a domestic violence case. Um, I was quite surprised that um, the information commissioner decided to take no action. There wasn't more detail there. I'm, I'm guessing they've obviously looked into it. Did they decide that these were really unique cases and uh, our systems were good but that something went wrong in those cases or or do, do we have anyone in this meeting who, who knows the the answer to that i think probably be from the legal democratic services and the information governance team would be able to answer that one so i could I could feed that that query get back get back to you on that one okay thank you um, the second one on page 183, the Brexit risk, I had kind of thought that that might have moved up a step with obviously the likelihood of a crash out at the end of the transition period having increased uh, just because of time going by without a plan being in place and it's getting closer and closer to the um, deadline. Um, but I see it remains the same. That's, uh, I mean, that probably based on... Uh, Three or four weeks ago, the information in the risk register um, that's been provided within the place directorate um, coordinating that. Um, so we could check in terms of any further update on that, if, if that's still the case, um, if there are any changes. Okay, thank you. Um, and thirdly, we continue to not list the climate emergency as a risk to Trafford. Um, we know that it's going to have enormous impact, even if we do everything we can now, which we're not. Uh, it's going to have enormous financial, health, economic, physical impacts on Trafford. And um, we've got people like Mark Carney warning the financial sector to start thinking about this, saying that large businesses are going to go bust because they're not thinking now about their resilience. Um, in the case of even the best case scenarios that are inevitable, let alone the um, much worst case scenarios that are, are looking likely. Is that something that we could consider putting on there as a standing item? That's something certainly I can feed back to CLT when we do the, the next um, review and update certainly feed that back so that's taken into account yeah thank you thank you councillor boys yeah can I, can I just add into what was said earlier about um these columns and arrows and stuff like that and what have you i mean yeah i appreciate what you're saying exactly mark in the sense that on page 184 you do have a key to what the arrows arrow up arrow down and horizontally actually mean uh, it's about the management of the risk but uh, and i would add particularly when you're looking at a black and white copy of print yeah. where you can hardly read the uh, the what's written in the columns of the colored co columns 
uh, it, when you're looking at what other columns to have, I think it might just be an idea to have a separate column for impact and, uh, and yeah. likelihood and put numbers in them, you know, and, uh, and, and some, something like that to, to, yeah. to, 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 to separate it out from this band of colour. Uh, and, and it's the same sort of conversation I was having with the combined authority accounts and audit meeting as well. So, uh, you know, I'll leave that one with you no, over, um, over the summer. Yeah. No, that's useful. It, it was one of the areas we, we were looking at, really, in terms of the presentation. So definitely, yeah, we'll look at that. Okay, I can't see any more hands up, so we just uh, note that report and go on to item uh, 13, the Council and Audit Committee 1920 annual report. Surprise, surprise, it's Mark again. Yeah, so th this is really, th this is a summary of yeah. all, all the work that you, yourselves have, have completed through 1920. Um, making sure you've met the, uh, in terms of the remit of the committee, carried out various roles. Um, covers each meeting, but of course it mentions the fact that the March meeting was cancelled, uh, but a lot of the items were still shared with members and where they haven't been, they've been picked up at this meeting. Um, and we would normally uh, have the, I think the, the, the chair normally presents this report to a, a future council meeting. Um, so it would just be to, yeah. Yeah. to a future meeting. Okay, any questions? I can't see any any hands up. Okay, so we just note that and it goes to council I mentioned, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, item uh, 14 is the council audit committee work program. Again, Mark. Last one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the proposed work programme for the year, we've had to adjust it this year um, with only four meetings to be more challenging in terms of times, but we've, we've rescheduled the items to make sure we've still uh, picked up all the, all the, the, the items we should cover. Um, as ever, it's a flexible programme. Things can be changed and added through, through the year. Um, so I think if, if, if members wanted to raise with Chair or the vice chair, any any issues they did wish to to add add to it. Um, we've taken into account the new statutory deadlines due to COVID nineteen, so we're taking those into account in terms of the role in approving the counts. Um, and also, it does note items that are covered outside of the meeting, so acknowledging that there's a training takes place and there's a forthcoming uh, event on the on the accounts. Um, but also number of reports that do get circulated outside the meeting as well, simply because of the timing and, and to make sure commi committee members still get updates through the rest of the year. Um, and it will be listed in the agenda, this programme, for discussion through the year as ever. Um, so it's really just asking the, the committee to agree that uh, the programme as it currently stands. Thanks, Mark. Councillor Duffield, got a hand up. Yeah, just very quickly, I'm just, I'm just, I suppose, a little bit concerned about all the challenges that we've got in this in-year budget and whether or not, not one, I don't want to particularly advocate lots more meetings, but whether or not we feel that we've got enough overview of the scrutiny of accounts if actually we're in such a challenging position this year that we are just, I suppose that's, that, that's it really, that it, we, we have enough opportunity really to make sure that we're supporting where we need where we need to in in terms of the work ahead of us and I, I know graham may want to add, add to this but certainly um we'll, we'll we'll circulate outside of the meeting as well other reports so the uh, the implications of covid19 the financial implications uh the budget monitoring reports for the next period um so we make sure the committee members still um get information uh, on, I don't know if, if Graham wants to, to add anything further on that. Yeah, just, just to add to that, um, obviously we've got the session planned for the, the calendar 22nd on the accounts and the, a bit more detail on the outturn. I think what, what I will send you all next week um, is a report that's going to executive on the 20th on yeah, Monday on the period two budget monitor. So I'll send that out once it's gone through executive. So you've got an update on basically where our in-year forecasts um, are looking 
and that that will include an update on all the COVID type um, expenditure and impacts. But what I would say is, um, if there's anything that you think you could do with more detail, just please, 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 just ask us. Chair, yes. Could I just mention briefly? Um, I think members will probably be aware, but the regular budget monitors which go to the executive those papers are always made available to all members of council so that's another route for members of this committee to be aware of high level budget implications thanks yeah. Joe. thanks joe yeah thank you thanks graham look i can't see any more hands up for that item so the last item is uh, any urgent business I have two. I don't say the relationship was. I'll use the chair's prerogative. The first was about the training, which has been mentioned. I think it's the 22nd, isn't it? Uh, a week today. So uh, that's open to all members, is it? Not just to, not to, just to us. It is. It's open to all members. Um, and based on the feedback so far, it looks like there's, there's quite a lot of interest in it. I can understand why as well. So hopefully yeah. that'll be a useful session here. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. The other item was just to uh, about Graham, because uh, I think most probably here do know, but some won't. Graham uh, was appointed a few weeks ago now to be director of uh, finance and systems, Graham. So when do you take over? Is it just in a few weeks or have you already done that? It's, it's, the, it's the 1st of August. I think at that stage, um, Nikki Bishop uh, ends her support towards the CCG and will go on a part-time basis still overseeing the council and I think I think it's useful to have us both still in uh, particularly Nikki in situ until we've got uh, the 21-22 budget sorted out so she'll be here until the end of March and I'm glad about that. Yes <laughs> yeah well I'm sure you know <laughs> You know, I, I would suggest we record in the minutes our congratulations to Graham yeah. on that. Well deserved. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. So it was worth the interview and some others weren't, but you, <laughs> it's well deserved, Graham. Thanks. Okay, so that, unless anybody else has any other items of urgent business? No, I think that's the, uh, the end of the meeting. It's almost half past five. Okay, thanks very much. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>